they mean serious business about their culture. Those people who write in Africans get their books read, they get their books bought. Those people who, who write plays in Africans, the same, you sing in Africans, people buy your CDs or whatever. Other groups don't seem to be quite as earnest in their political awareness, or the political awareness does not translate into action, especially the action of buying books, and that translates to the action of reading. Sadly, all the international exams that uh, are taking place condemn South Africa as a nation that does not read. That is very sad because it translates to a future that is not very bright. That's your future. I'm going to start off, I know I'm going to talk about mother to mother. I'm going to start off with a little poem, not very long. In my only book of, of, of uh, poetry called Please Take Photographs. That's the title of the book. The poem is called Being. Being because it pleases our maker. We have no choice in the fashion of our making. The sentence for our being is choice in the manner of our living. That's the end of the poem. I repeat it because it's short. Because it pleases our maker, we have no choice in the fashion of our making. The sentence or the price for our being is choice in the manner of our living. In other words, whatever higher power you prescribe to, you believe in. Allah, Jehovah, God, it doesn't matter. That higher being made you the you you are. You didn't decide you wanted to be male, female, black, white, green, blue. You wanted to be tall. But you are made in perfection of your maker. Don't ever let anybody tell you you are not perfect. You are. You are made in perfection. You are who you are because you were made to be that way. The only thing you are asked to do about your life is mind it. That's all. No price paid. Mind your life. Take it seriously. Is the only one you have. If I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of my life. I have two books of autobiography. The first one is called To My Children's Children. It's about growing up. People read that book and say, there is no bitterness. I had no reason to be bitter. I didn't know, I didn't even know I was poor until I started working. Part two is called Forced to Grow. Like pushed to grow. And that book begins with this sentence, I was a has-been at the age of 23. By 23, my life was already damaged beyond repair. Now try not to do that. Try to live a life that is always admirable, always worthy. Don't do things that can bring shame on you, your parents, your community. One day you'll be, maybe not as old as I am, you will be old and look back on this experience of being here with others and remember faces you knew, faces you liked, people you played with. Make sure when those people meet you, A, they can still recognize you, you have not damaged your face and your, your body with drugs and things like that, and B, you can be proud to say, remember me, I am so and so because you are living a life worth living. I'm coming to mother to mother about this book. This is a novel, my first novel. I've written many books. I'm Googleable. 
if you Google my name, if you forget my name, and you put, this is the easiest title to remember, Mother to Mother, all the other books will come out. If you remember P-U-K-U, which is, uh, I think, vendor for book, Puku, if you put P-U-K-U dash and my name, you will get a whole long laundry list. I have written more than 135 children's books. I have also written grown, you know, books for grown-ups, like this one can be read by young people like yourselves and also grown-ups. As you had the, the gentleman who introduced me, uh, he read it and he enjoyed it. Menia? Uh, Menia Mohammed. He also enjoyed it. So, I'm going to try and keep my mind, my, my, just tell you about the writing of the book, that, you know, so that to leave enough time. If there's a lot of talking, I keep quiet to give you a chance. And if I see who you are, I call you right up here, you give the talk. So be careful. <laughs> it happened, when that happened, I wasn't even in South Africa. I have spent the last 25 years of my working life in the United States, working for the United Nations. And so when this happened, I was in New York, I was in headquarters. I heard about it because it made news immediately. It was in the air, it was on TV, it was in the press. I was very sad. You all know that. When we hear of a person, don't you feel sad and shocked of unnecessary deaths and, and killings? I was shocked. I was particularly sad that this happened in Cape Town. South Africa is my own country. Cape Town is where I did a lot of my, I was four when we moved to Cape Town from the Eastern Cape. And so I regard Cape Town as my hometown. And I was even sadder that it happened in Mubuletu, which is where my home was then. One of the jobs, I've done many jobs, Towards the better side of my life, I worked at, as a welfare worker, social worker, under a trained social worker. And the offices were in Langa, and we did Langa and Guguleto. And the areas of Guguleto, section one, section two, section three. Section three was my area, and Amy died in section three. And I could take you to that spot blindfold. I could take you there, I knew exactly where she, you know, where that garage, I could picture it. I was so sad. I felt so sorry. And then what made me even sorrier was that this poor child wasn't even South African. Now, I've never advocated violence. I am not a violent person. I, I even during apartheid, I never felt white South Africans should be killed. No. But it was even more tragic that she wasn't even South African. She died because of the color of her skin. The people who killed her were anti-South African whites. She wasn't even South African. And she had come to this country to help black women better prepare themselves for the coming vote. And one short day, one day short of her departure, She's here for a year. You know how many days there are in a year? When she has, of all those days, she has only one day left. How unfortunate can you be? This is the day she gets killed. It was very sad. I felt so sad. I felt sorry for the Bill family that I didn't know. I kept on working at my job. Four years later, she died. No, not four years later. Eight months later, she died on the 24th of um, August. She died in August, because that's my birth month. She died in August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Eight months later, I'm here. Why was I here? Can anybody remember? No, no, please put up your hand. Why was I here eight months after Amy Bill was killed? Come on, guys. <laughs> I'd like the younger people. What year was Amy killed? 
1993. So the next year was what year, yes? April 94. Why would I come back? Yes, sir. For the boat. Thank you, sir. I came back for the boat. I can tell you right now. I didn't even vote. I was so excited. I went around like a mad thing, asking people questions. How do you feel about it? I was so excited. I knew the ANC was going to win. I'm not an ANC member. I never belonged to any political party. There are reasons for that. I, I was so excited and I, I wanted just to capture the moment. I'm here for six weeks on vacation. On the last day, my best friend from way back, grade two. Now, I've been pushing a big decade. On the way back, she drives me to the airport, parks her car. Those days, you could park your car and get inside and sit down and have coffee. That was before 9-11. You take somebody to the airport, you sit there and have coffee. You could go to the airport as, a, as if you're taking your car. And go to the airport to have tea or lunch. You can now. Things have changed. Violence has escalated. So Lindy Way takes me there and we are talking about things as, you know, we talk about the excitement of the vote and did you see how everybody was happy? And then we talk about the four young men who, who were you know, accused, arrested, and were on trial. The four boys who killed Amy Bill. Then we talk about the trial that they are on trial. And Lindy Way says to me, do you know one of those four boys is not Tutu Zelo's son. Who is not Tutu Zelo? I could not believe it. I, I, I was so shocked. Between the two of us, we only know one woman called Non Tutu Zelo. I said, which Non Tutu Zelo? She said, Non Tutu Zelo, Non Tutu Zelo. Like, which other Non Tutu Zelo do we know? And I just went ice cold inside. This is somebody. I played with as a child, this non them. I, 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 I grumble a lot about my life. Why didn't this happen in my life? Why did, but at a moment like that, I am pulled rudely back to, to reality. I looked at my life, here I am, working at the UN, headquarters, no help. <laughs> I mean, who do I think I am? And I look at non them. And I think of our lives as eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds. Nothing said I would end up living in New York and she would end up the mother of a killer. And then I realized, dear God, that could so easily have been me. That could so easily have been my son. The next thing out of my mouth was, how is she coping? Now, I don't know about you. Until that moment, I had never given a thought to the parents of a killer. Do you think about them? Do you? If you do, you are better people than I am. Even you don't know who got killed, but invariably, because we are, we are, you know, we are socialized like that. We are brought up like that. Who do we feel for? The, 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 the family that has lost, the victim's family. We all empathize with the victim's family. But that moment taught me something. The parents of murderers don't go on picnics. And in a way, without minimizing the suffering of the victim's parents, their road is a harder road to hold. I am telling you, if I had to choose between being a killer's mother and having my child being killed, I wouldn't wish to be the killer's mother. Much as I love my children and I wouldn't want them killed, but if I had to choose, I would rather be the mother who has lost a child than the mother of the child who has killed someone. Because you know society has no time for you, doesn't care for you, and if they think about you, they condemn you. Did I think I was going to write a novel? No. I had written two books of autobiography by then, two books of short stories, a play. I didn't know how to write a novel. 
some, somewhere in my crazy education, somebody had told me, some teacher had told me, fiction is something that never happened. Now I can tell you something. Which of you would like to write one day? Yes, one, two, three, oh, no. let me tell you a, a good piece of advice. If you ever sit down like I did and try to write a, 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 a piece of fiction about something that never happened, that's a book that is never going to happen. Fiction is taking what has happened and changing certain things so that you don't really write non you know, you don't take non-fiction and make it fiction. You, you take a piece here and a piece there and one here and, and mix it all together and make a new story. But I wasn't writing about this. But for four years after I heard about this tragedy and the involvement of somebody who, as we say, gets it lost. When you know somebody the way I knew not to do them, you say, I know her saliva. You know where saliva is found? Okay. Poor children the world over, not just in South Africa, not just black kids. I found that even in Italy when I was there and somewhere else, poor kids throughout the world. If one of them has a, 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 a piece of candy in the mouth, guess what happens? Stick it to, stick it to. Very soon everybody has little pieces of candy in their mouth. So when you know somebody from childhood like that, you say, oh, I know her intimately, like I know her salad. I've eaten something out of her mouth. We have broken pieces of sweets together. I stayed with a big sorrow for four years in my heart, feeling the sadness of Nondutuzen, thinking about how awful it must be to be her. I felt sorry for her because, as I said before, that could have been my life. My life changed. Didn't change magically. Nobody came in and bestowed their life on me. You heard the poem I read you? Whose business is it to make your life what it can be? Put your hand here. Put your hand here. I want to see your hand going. Whose business is it? Mine. Whose business is it? It's nobody else's. Even if your, 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 your life goes very up, like you make a mistake and you find your life has gone wrong, nobody's going to mend your life for you. It's your business. Unfortunately, a lot of people my generation, slightly older, slightly younger, do not become a perfect product of your environment if that environment is toxic. Do not become a perfect product of an environment that is toxic. If you're in a home, and I'm not, I don't know your homes, that where there is abuse, do not become an abuser. If somewhere where you live, there's a lot of drugs, you don't have to be a drug. You can escape your environment. If you're poor, I always tell people, because I was, I was poor as a child, but as a young adult, I told you, part two of my autobiography starts with the sentence, I was a husband. A washout by the age of 23. Nobody's going to come and mend your life. It's your job to mend your life. Take your life seriously. But then, when I look at people like Nundu Tuzen, then I ask myself, because I know myself, my life is no reward for the good I have done. I'm not that good. I should have this life. No. Maybe the Almighty is still giving me a chance to do some good in the world. Then I ask myself, but what about the poor non to zealots of this world? That's one of the reasons I write, so that their story, too, can be told. non to zealots in our culture, a culture based on Ubuntu in the village, when tragedies of this nature happen, the family of the, of, of the perpetrator has to go to the family of the victim to apologize and make amends. In this situation, I didn't see that happening. But I wanted Amy's mother to know what it was like to be the mother of a killer and to give Amy's mother some idea of what children such as those go through and rely and call it growing up. 
That's not growing up. Growing up involves nurturing, involves support. And a lot of our children during apartheid and unfortunately even now are not being brought up. Yes, a child will grow older every year, but are they being nurtured? Are they being guided? Are they being supported? I am very sad to leave you with this word. When I came into the school and sensed the atmosphere in the school, the ethos of the school, which delighted my heart, I want to congratulate the principal and staff of the school. And I hope you young people at the school value what you are getting here. It is priceless. What you are getting here, you will need and use for the rest of your lives. Do not waste this opportunity. A lot of your compatriots are not getting what you are getting. Unfortunately, you are going to have to share this space, this country, with those people. So as you learn, also remember, you'll be carrying the burden of all those children who are not getting what you are getting. And you may have good lives, and I wish you good lives. But as long as your good life is next to somebody who is having a rubbish life, your life is next to rubbish. Yes. Do we live with crime now? Yes. I live in a good area of Cape Town. But I live next to crime. This is what we are leaving you, unfortunately. We are leaving you a country that is in disarray. So much as you are getting what you are getting, know that a lot of what you will have to do is mend all that brokenness that will be yours to mend. You are going to have to do it. We haven't done it. There's a lot of brokenness out there. Don't go and add to it. Be part of the solution. The book I wrote eventually then was for Amy's mother. And before you ask this question, I'm a bank book, a real coward. Do you think I went and interviewed Amy's mother? Me? Call up somebody I don't know and ask for them? No, I didn't. Do you think I went to non to do them? No! I wrote that book. But then June, when the book was going to be published in September, the publisher wanted me back in Cape Town to do final edit. But even, even I, coward as I am, I became more afraid now of the book appearing at the windows of shops and I hadn't spoken to the two people. It's just called decency. So I became more afraid of this. I mean, that was now the big thing. How can these people know about the book when it's out? I was still scared, but now I was more scared of offending them like that, that I disrespected them. I write a story about what happened to them, and I don't even know. So, feeling this high, I went and met the babies. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Their mouth is gone. I was still scared, but I was more scared of them finding out after the fact, so I went and uh, so that to make this as meaningful for you, I would welcome really if you ask the questions I have now covered in the writing of the book. Oh yeah, yeah, I forget how I wrote the book. So I have, remember I have all these books, two autobiographies, part one and part two, and two books of short stories, and a, a, a play, and, 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 and uh, children's books. And I told you, I don't know how to write a novel, remember? How do I write this one? Well, I, I, I see a notice board at, at the YMCA, uh, 96th Street and Broadway. Um, there's going to be a workshop for advanced novel writing. It didn't say beginners. Did you hear advanced? Do I have a novel? No. Doesn't stop me, I go. It's on a Saturday morning. We sit in a circle, you have to introduce yourself, and he wants simple things. Name, title of your novel, and what it's about, 
and why you feel the world needs this book. So me, Cindy Mamakona, I'm from South Africa. I'm going to write a novel called Mother to Mother, the words of the mother of a killer to the words of the mother of a victim. And all 30 people in the group went, wow, like it was such a profound thing. Then I tell the story I just told you about what Ubuntu demands of us in situations like that. Okay, next Saturday we meet, either bring uh, outline of the novel or chapter one. I flew home. I knew I was going to write this novel. I wrote what subsequently became chapter one. All the words of Nontutu Zelo, I, talking to Mrs. Bill. This is a six weeks course, eh? You're going to meet for six. So second Saturday I go and I read my chapter and everybody goes, wow. I go home. I come back next Saturday, I still have my 30 pages. I go home, I come back the next 30 pages until the course ended. All I had wanted to say was said in what became chapter one. The rest is what is called, I kept that 30 pages for the longest one, but I knew nobody in their right mind, no publisher was going to publish 30 books for me and call it another. I knew that I had to do something. The rest of it is what is called creative writing. Thank you. Now, if you have questions. That's a dedication. Yeah. That's a dedication. I'm just remembering my poor father from what he did. He's not like this father in the book. There was a, a hand up there. Yes, sir. Yes, you. <laughs> what did he say? There's, there's going to be a movie about the book. If you make it. <laughs> yes, sir. I can't hear you. All two stories, guys. Does he have a study guide at the back? He has questions and some answers at the back. That's a weird question. Yes, ma'am. First, then, then, sir. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, ma'am
And then could they get a copy? I took his card, the publisher would. Could we go out and have coffee? I have another meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a blatant lie. I didn't want to have coffee with Mr. Bill. I wanted out of that office. Bye bye, Mr. Bill. I was uncomfortable. And then, months later, I'm sitting down in my office and the phone rings. GPI, United Nations, this is Peter Bill. I sit down. Yes. We got the book. Yes. <laughs> we read the book. <laughs> we loved the book. We bought 30 copies by giving. Why didn't the men say that in the first place? <laughs> I was so scared. They were going to be offended by the book. He called me from Cape Town. I, I'm in New York. We got the This is Peter P. Yes. We got the book. Yes. We read the book. <laughs> we love the book. Anyway, and then, uh, December 10th, do you know what December 10th is? I can hear, I can see a hand up. 10th of December is an is, um, international what? Who teaches history? International Day of Human Rights, Human Rights Day. Yeah. On the 10th of December that year, the year the book came out, 1998, the, uh, Amy's parents were invited to the United Nations General Assembly to give, uh, to talk, to address the, 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 the GA. And they, wise people, insisted that I join them on the podium. Yeah, well. <laughs> so there I am sitting with them. We talk about, you know, uh, human rights in South Africa. And then we go out and have lunch at the Japanese restaurant. We were now good friends, we were talking. And Amy's mom said she couldn't finish reading the book. It, it was just hard for her. And I explained my, you know, what I've just talked to you about, how I came to write the book, why I wrote the book, that kind of thing. Second time we had lunch at the same restaurant a year or two later, she gave me a hug and said, I read it through. It helped me better understand. It was as though I had won the prize. It helped me better understand. That's the only reason I wrote the book. If I had been a person of better courage, more courage, I would not have read written a book. I would have just sat down with Mrs. B and talked to her. I am not that kind of person. I tend to be shy. You won't believe it. I'm a shy person. Left to my own devices, I wouldn't open my mouth in front of people. But I forced myself to. I used to teach. The first day I went teaching, standard three, I'm 19, all the way from Latin, I'm saying, the kids don't know you're shy, the kids don't know you're shy, the kids don't know you're shy, the kids don't know you're shy until I reach standard three, they are nine. I'm 19, the kids don't know you're shy, the kids don't know you. I hope I answered your question. No, the boy first then. Yeah. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, as I said, I had the 30 pages for about three months, and then I started writing. After that, once I started thinking, I must make fiction, I must make a story. And I drew the characters in my head, made notes. I think after that it went pretty fast, I think. After the three months I wasted, no actually, three months wasted, and then it's a year, and I'm sitting with 30 pages. Then I wake up to the fact that I must make a book. About two and a half years in all, yeah. But my last novel just came out two years ago, Chasing the Tales of My Father's Cattle. Uh, I went away to Atlanta. In eight weeks, I had a novel. And people say it's the best book I've ever written. And I'm thinking, I waste all this time. Next book will be four weeks, and I'll have a novel. <laughs> Thank you.
the biggest barrier you have when you are writing a book? The biggest barrier I have when I'm writing a book, believe it or not, is me. You write, you stop. When you go back a week later, you have no idea what you were writing about. The, you know, that's why the last novel I wrote went so far. I went away from home, I had an outline, I knew what was going to happen in each chapter, and I sat down and I did very little as I wrote. The biggest something you wrote for lots of writers is yourself. You stop yourself, you get involved in other things, you get distracted. If you know what you're going to write about, if it needs uh, research, you start with that. You collect all the material you need, and then you write. Writing is one of the easiest things to do if you don't take yourself too seriously. It's like telling a story. If you, if you ever travel by train or by bus, when the bus is there, oh, we really, never mind. Those days are gone. You sit in the bus going to what people herself, mensa herself, they tell stories, they don't write notes about what they're going to talk about. Somebody says, oh yeah, you think, if you have an aunt or an uncle who likes to talk, writings like that, you're just telling a story. Believe in the story, the story will... You know, you don't know what the book is going to be. At the beginning, you have no idea how the book is going to end. But you write anyway. And a good way of remembering. Do you write letters? No, you don't. Oh, the pity, never mind. I won't do that. My perspective of the killers, which I hoped I portrayed, is that these are not intentionally evil people. They are not evil, and they don't mean to be evil. They are just kids like you, really, caught up in a moment, in a moment of unthinking, when you suspend your personhood, when you forget who you are, and do things you wouldn't do in your right mind. Two of those young men now work for the Amy Bill Foundation. Question there. First, first there. Yeah? They are good kids. They're good young people. They never meant to kill anybody. That morning when they woke up, they were just normal. You know, you're sitting here. One day you're going to read, I don't know who. Somebody you knew killed his wife or she killed the husband. How would you feel? Not so and so on. They were like that. People who knew them were that, just that surprised. If you hear your classmate boiled and in water and poured it over her husband, would you believe it? <laughs> what were my feelings to the bills after I finished writing? I was hoping I had not met them. I was hoping I knew the way if a family in grief, and I was very sad for them. But I was hoping that through the grief, they would come to an understanding of the history of this country and how the anger that led to the children, to, to their child being killed. Those four young men were held responsible. I feel all South Africans of all shades were responsible for the murder of Amy Bill. Amy Bill died because we allowed race hate to get to those levels. We are all culpable, not just those four. Those four were just the instrument of our collective anger, collective irresponsibility, and collective evil. I mean, when we talk about white people during our passing, you wouldn't know that we're talking about human beings. And vice versa. We allowed hate. We felt they oppress us, so they are this. Thing. Doesn't work. My feelings are after I wrote the book, I was glad I'd written the book. I was scared that everybody would be wouldn't like me and people would think I was stupid to write this book and how dare I. And every critic, you know those people who write uh, reviews and starts off by saying, when I, I, I said, the critic says, I wondered, what kind of a writer would dare write this? 
But when I read the book, I better and Everybody starts by being shocked I wrote the book. But when they read the book, then they come to a better understanding and applaud the book. <laughs> I, I met Mr. Bill, then I went to Don Juju Zebra's house, I knew where she did. I also carried four books for her, uh, and I gave her the books and I explained to her, and she thanked me and we asked about, where's your brother, where's your sister, what? when did your mom, you know, that kind of thing, when you haven't seen somebody. And I left her with the books, and many, many years later, there was a play. The face you see here, you know, Jim Yun Charlie, she did mother to mother the play. I wrote the play. She wanted, she came to me and said she wanted a one woman show. I must make a play. Then I, 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 I made the play and she acts in it. And when Nontutu Zedo was invited to the preview the night before the, the opening, she wept so much she could never come to the play the next night. She said she can't. When Amy's mother saw the play, she wept and she said the play was harder than the play. Next. Sorry, you will be next. As soon as I'm done. It's really the mother's word. You know, She's reminiscing. Oh, oh, is that the general first year? Yeah. Did the parents of this year? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, of all the parents, guess which parent has met the bills? Who? No need to say. I knew her. I really, I mean, I knew she would. And the bills ended up putting her youngest child, her daughter, through private school. They were reconciled. They really were a remarkable family. Then, yeah, okay. Uh, what's the Amy Bill Foundation? The Amy Bill Foundation is really about the parents of Amy, the family, feeling that this country, there were a lot of young people like those who killed their, their child. And they wanted to help young people at risk of descending into criminality that they don't descend into. You know, in other words, young people who are at school but not doing well, maybe getting into, to help them stay in school and, and stay, stay wholesome, to help young people not become criminals. I'm most sympathetic to the killer's family or the victim. What a question. <laughs> That's a hard question. I, the book would not have been born in my heart if I had not known how to do that. That's a fact. I've had lots of people killed. I've never felt that kind of reaction. I've, I had never before felt sorry for the parents of killers. So I have to admit that. There is a huge feeling of sadness for people for not to do that. But that does not remove me from feeling sorry for them. I was destitute. There is a difference between poverty and destitution. Destitution means you don't have two beans to rub together. You don't know what you are going to eat every day. That's what happened. So the government, there is an organization called the South Africa Child Welfare Society. White children can go there, colored children go there, Indian children go there. You think black, black children can go there? No! But it says no. So I couldn't apply for grants. I was angry at husband. After all these children, you ran away? What am I supposed to do? I was also angry at society because African people love children. You hear that a lot. You dare not be a woman with children and there's no husband around. Your name is dead. And I'm thinking, why am I the 
one who has these ugly names and there's no ugly name for him. I'm going to be looked down upon. He is called free. So I was angry. And then I realized I can be angry until smoke comes out of my ears. It doesn't change my life. I have to think about the way of changing my life. 25, 20 so, I woke up, I started studying. I didn't have matric. My matric is by A levels, is by correspondence. I didn't have uh, A levels, I did A levels correspondence. I didn't have degree, I did degree correspondence. Then I got a scholarship and I went to Columbia University to do my master's. Then I got a job at the UN and, and you see what I mean? That's how my life changed. Did I choose this thing? You give me too much credit. I didn't choose the style of writing. Each book I write, as I said in the beginning, I sit down because there's a feeling either of anger or something, and I want to pour the story out. The style comes when I write. When I was in book two or book three, I got such a shock. I suddenly realized if you ask me to write the first book, I couldn't. Any book that comes out of you, any writing you do, you cannot repeat it. It's gone. The next day you write something different. So the reading, each, each book, it just comes out. You do the broad plan. The boys were arrested, charged, and, and found guilty, and sentenced to life in prison. They were, they were serving life in prison when there was uh, the, what was it? the TRC, and they applied to appear before the TRC, and the bills didn't oppose that. And when, and when they, were, they were forgiven, Amy's father, I read in the New York Times, said he, he was happy for them, but he hoped, I hope those were his words, I hope society will give those young men the support they need to live worthwhile lives. No child brings herself or himself up. You all need support, and when you grow up, you support others. And you must thank the, the, your families, the grown-ups that nurture you, your teachers, your, 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 you know, your religious leaders, your parents, and bigger siblings, your buddhis and your sisters. You know, people are raised by others. Yes. Don't start with Everybody will be lining up, sit here in the front, and hold your book where, where there's the publisher's name. But when we read the book, we say, thank you, children. And Amy's parents, as I said, they embrace it. Thank you. Can I, can I ask two questions um, that are related to your style of writing? One of the questions... Not yet, Uhuru. Okay. <laughs> The first question, it's about your style of writing. You were mixing um, current events and the previous events. Then secondly, there is a mystery on uh, Mkolis' conception, as well as another mystery on uh, where China disappeared to. Where China what? Disappeared to. It is said China went, you went to work. I forgot this China thing about the country. No, I mean Mkolis' father, that he went to work and he never returned. What exactly happened? Do you want it to remain a mystery like that? As well as the conception for Mkolis. A lot of fathers are unknown. You know, what happened to the father? The wife doesn't know. Okay. Either the person disappeared because he wanted to, or something happened that he couldn't control. The style of writing is that you made just now. I wanted this one to be about what happened. So the, 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 the current, the then current political situation, but I also wanted to link to what had happened.
Bye.